welcome everyone. I'm really excited to see people. <laughs> you know, this it's still a really new experience to get to go out and talk to people in public, so I'm still going. <gasps> I want to introduce a very good friend of mine. This is Joan Ganley, and Joan and I have known each other a long time. <laughs> yeah. Joan's garden has been open on more than one occasion. She is an amazing gardener, and she. one of the things that touched me was the day that we were touring, and you have that driveway at the front. Mm -hmm. And I'm walking along, and there's a crack in the driveway, so she didn't waste that space. She planted it. <laughs> and I went, oh. And she's just like me. All the way down the side of her house, she's got planters. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yep. And she has the most incredible peony collection that I've ever seen. Oh, thank you. Yeah, she, she has this yellow one that just entranced me. Blooming right now. That's oh, Mar Marcella. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which is called Bart. Barcella, Ito? Ito, yeah, the yeah. Ito. If you're ever looking for a really neat collection of peonies, they're the Ito collection, I-T-O-H. And his work, yeah. his work is amazing. He's Japanese, was Japanese, and he started working on them um, back in the 40s. And he made it, he lived to be till 1954. He never really saw how popular all of the varieties that he created came, became. And of course now Ito is a commercial name because they're making and producing more and more of his colors. But his selection was because what, Joan? Oh, it just, you know, it's amazing like to have so many, like the, as far as the selections go. Yes. Like Barcella and, um, oh gosh, Cora Louise. I was just going to say Cora Louise. Singing in the Rain, yeah. Yank Doodle Dandy. I mean, there's so, Scrumptilicious, I think, is another one. Yeah, yeah, just Scrumptilicious some, is yeah, what I remember, yes. Super great varieties, yeah, 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 for sure. And they're hardy here. Like they're people really hardy here. think maybe they're not, but they are. They are. They do really All our local yeah. garden centers, and they're doing, a lot of the growers are doing more and more work with them and bringing them in, so we're seeing more and more of the choices because it's very you go to the Edo website and it's still based out of Japan it's amazing what they produce on that little island and they've got 50 to 60 varieties and you're going oh my god there's that many and for a while here all we had was Barzilla yes, that's yeah right. and and it was a fascinating one because it was yellow but I find myself reading these pages and looking at all these varieties of things and they've done so much more. But the other thing Joan does is alpine plants. And she has probably one of the nicest collections. And, and she has a shady garden in several spots. And, they, and I was amazed and, and said as much to my friend, oh, look, they're growing in the shade. See, you can do this. <laughs> That's right. And actually, and the Hort Society has a, a new rock garden, don't they? Yes, we just alpine. put in a new alpine mound. And one of our affiliate members, and Craig's. it's Craig's, the Calgary Rock and Alpine Gardens, they can, did this. They built it for us. They put it back together after it survived our abuse at the old house. <laughs> but it's back, and it's looking really good. It's yeah. coming along gorgeous. Yeah. But you had one along the front of your sidewalk at the oh, front. The succulent fence. Yes. Yeah, with chicks and hens. Oh, you should see it now. Oh, oh really? It's, yeah, it's really filling in. They are. They love uh, the heat. I guess. They love yeah. the heat, and they're such easy care plants. Yes. That uh, I think they're just perfect for this this kind of summer that we're having right now. Maybe not the wet part that we had, but yeah. <laughs> this part for sure. <laughs> so. I thought for a while there, my garden was just going to float down the driveway. Yeah. I came home one day and there was this trail of soil and I went, who oh, was in the garden? And then I realized it had been raining yeah. and the trail of soil was just going down where the downspout ended. It just decided to continue its easiest path. Yeah. So that is the part about dealing with our extra water and our extra, and now we're having heat. But the gardens are actually switching over, aren't they? They're, they're doing really, really, really well. Yeah. So I, I get quite, quite excited. excited. It's really lush this year too. Oh, Do you yes. find that? Yeah. Like everything is just kind of exploded now with this heat, right? Yes. So got the moisture. Maybe maybe what we should all think about is the fact that maybe it is a good thing to have monsoon June. So 
Yesterday, Joan and I had a chat briefly about what was going on in our respective gardens, and we were discussing a little bit of crucial equipment to our lives oh, yes. and to what a gardener takes in the garden with them right away. So I said, Joan, bring me your favorite tools with me. So she brought them. So Well, I brought one about my favorite. I said to um, Catherine, we were setting up here that her tool bag is so neat and tidy. And she said she just cleaned it. I just cleaned it yesterday. <laughs> so I would have brought my entire bucket. So I have an old galvanized bucket that I just kind of toss all my tools in. Yes. And well, everything gets tossed in there. And um, right now, because of just gardening and just being so active in the garden, um, my tool bucket is an absolute mess. Like there's plant tags in there, there's my tools, there's, I mean, it's a mess. So I just pulled out my favorite tool, which is um, this Hori Hori knife. And um, it has seen some better days. I did some volunteer gardening at one time. So I put some pink tiger tape on it to identify this is mine. Don't anybody else touch it. <laughs> And uh, so that's kind of worn off, but so you can see it's gotten some wear over the years. Uh, what I really like about it is that it has a serrated edge. Uh, this edge can be sharp. The opposite edge can be sharpened yes. to cut things as well. It has a pointy end for uh, digging out little things even. Uh, as well, I find like I have a, a paver walkway and you know we that's why stuff. i like it yeah it gets inside i can stick this in between two pavers and just kind of pry it and the weed will come out so you know kind of make a little bit of a use that's it to make the whole a separation. thing with dandelions you've got to get in and get down. down like don't just you know don't do just this get the thing down a bit and then just slightly wobble it and you can yeah. usually get a good percentage of the root yeah especially if it's wet like yes. if it's been already yeah. rained or right after the rain that sort of thing um but also this has uh, i don't know if yours has it as well the markers for measurement no mine didn't because mine's one of the originals okay so this yeah. is really handy too because sometimes you just want to know uh so how deep is that or you know uh, if bulbs when oh, planting bulbs, planting right. bulbs it's really good for yeah. doing stuff like that yeah so uh so this has had a really a long uh long life in my garden we we're talking about the itos in japan this is made in japan and i think hori hori i think yes. that is a japanese term if it I'm is not and i don't know what it is because i've looked <laughs> it up more than once Does anybody know what that stands for no <laughs> i know it probably says dig dig yeah hori, hori. or something dig dig <laughs> cut, cut. <laughs> So um, anyway, this, this is my favorite tool. Well, and I, I have a few favorites, but probably still, I still like my hoe. Oh. I use my hoe all Long the time. Handle? Well, actually, what I like about my hoe is that it's a telescoper. So you twist it out and put it in. And I have to apologize. I was going to bring it, but I do believe it's sitting beside the dog kennel because the dog went away today. <laughs> so she... Well, she was going with my friends. She was going to stay with Auntie Janice and Uncle Steve for a day. <laughs> so it's probably there still. But I have, you know, over the years you develop the tools that fit your hands and you like the best. And this one's been in my life for a really long time. And I really like it because it has a strong wooden handle and it's got a welded shaft in the middle, which is what makes it valuable to me. But the other thing I like about it is the, no, the grip, the non-slip grip. But the thing is, I've had this one so long that the grip used to be down here. And now because I'm a pointer and dig down, I've pushed the grip to the point where it's coming off now. So I, every once in a while, my friend Glenn comes over and I say, could you just pull the handle back together? And he does. But that's why I like them. I look for tools that have a bit of grip and a bit of size and I'll use them all the time. Now do you prefer just uh, do you prefer like a wooden handle or uh, you know there's the foam like you, this is wood with foam on it. Yes I prefer a wood handle or a foam handle okay. it just depends yeah. but I much prefer those. I find plain metal is very slippery yeah. and I find that I can't get a good grip on them and I've also found over the years as I've gotten a, a little bit older I need more pry and I discovered that these longer handled little spades or trowel as it's called 
properly, but I find these a lot easier to work with now. So shorter handle, I'm not as wild about them. I like to be able to get in there and use them. And I mean, this tool bucket and I have been together for a long time, so much so that it's developed a few holes. So I have to go around before I leave somewhere and make sure that um, I haven't lost things. And one of the things I lose quite regularly is I use little paint brushes and I use them for three things. But the big and most important thing is that I pollinate my tomatoes. When it looks like it's a slow day in the garden with the bugs and I'm not getting production out of my tomatoes, this is helps the production. And I will go along and I'll be the bee. So, but the thing is that now this thing is getting older, so I have to keep, keep switching corners. But the thing you want to look for is natural bristles. The, the harder bristles don't do the job as easily. So I'll do that. And I'll go around and I'll pollinate. And then about three days later, I'll go repeat the process just because. But it usually helps to get, I finally now with the weather warmer. One of the things that I have found is that now the weather's warmed up, I'm having tomatoes. I'm getting tomatoes. Have you, have you all got tomatoes yet? They're coming? Yes. So I usually tell people mid-August, start pruning the bottom leaves off your tomatoes and you get better ripening and you get better tomato production. So it's just something, because our day length changes. You know, like we've, we're at the first day of summer already. <laughs> so the day length starts to change. It isn't really obvious right now, but it's happening. It is happening. Yes, it is. Sure. I mean, but you know what? We just had a full moon. It's today. Yeah. Two, at 2.38, the moon becomes full. So in the daylight. Yeah. So I, I haven't figured that out yet. But I mean, when you look at what they say about the moon and the development of the moon and how it goes on, the first, the first part of the moon, but when it's brand new, it has a really strong gravitational pull and it helps to seed at that time. But the full moon, and this is a full buck moon, and that means that the antlers on the elk and etc. are producing and they're fuzzy. And the old farmers used to say, as did our indigenous folk, that that helped to pollinate the corn. Well, in point of fact, what they were doing when they were bashing the corn stalks is mimicking the, min, the, the wind and it would get the pollination happening on the corn. So they aided in the pollination process with their full antlers. I mean, and then, I mean, some populations in parts of the country refer to it as the full thunder moon, and you can never guess why that is, right? Mm -hmm. Haven't we had a few? We have a little thunder. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I watch a little bit of the phases of the moon, and I always have, because my grandpa did. And my grandpa and my mom. Oh my gosh, one of her things was that if she wasn't getting good cabbages, she would take a dish towel and on the full moon in August, she would not go and bury it beside the cabbages in the full moon. I have never found the scientific reasoning behind it, but she had big cabbages. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I really like the folklore involved sometimes in what we do with the gardening but the moon produces more red light and our sun produces a lot of blue light. It's the two combinations that give seed germination and help for foliage def definition, etc. So that's why I follow the moon and it's one of those things. I, I always thought it was kind of odd, but I'm not apparently. No, you know what, it's, that's very true because um, I had an uncle years ago in Leamington, Ontario, where, I mean, that's a a big food producing area of the country and he had a greenhouse operation and he planted by uh, like using the moon and the stars and you know and astrology everything was aligned just right he was out there you know making sure that everything was planted and he was a very successful uh grower so uh, it was my grandpa ago. and my grandma yeah and, and my mom so some of these old uh folklore and this old information uh, it's with us for a reason because it works, right? Yes. So a lot of it yes. does. A so. lot of it yeah. does. So, and it's kind of fun to, to experiment, right? <laughs>
right now, right now, just let them produce as many as they want to. But this speaks to pruning the bottom of the tomato. And then the other part of it is tomatoes grow up and depending on the type of tomato you've planted, because there's three kinds of determinant uh, tomatoes, determinant, which are literally bushes and they produce probably one crop in the season. Then there's the indeterminate tomato, which produces all season long and keeps growing up and up and up. And then there's the semi-determinate, which are the ones that produce Roma tomatoes. And they'll, they'll produce a first crop and then they'll produce a second crop quite often. But the trick is with tomatoes is when they come up and the branches are forming off the side, and you're getting almost this little extra piece of growth like my thumb and the first straight stem and then it's got a grouping of leaves and then it's got this new little thing coming. The best thing you can do is pinch those out. Clean them out. The more you clean them out, the less energy is wasted by the plant trying to produce all those extra. So the first thing you want to look at is the semi-determinants right now are just starting to produce. So the determinants are really producing a lot. So look at your tomato and see how many side shoots and take them out of there and then take some of the bottom growth off just because if they're they've developed a nice strong stem take it out and this also do you stake them do you have them held up with sticks or stakes good okay so really and truly it's eliminating the side shoots and the suckering and the extra babies they will start to produce side shoots and they don't necessarily grow evenly so that's when you take out the side shoots to just get that going but the indeterminates will grow big and wide my friend trellises them he espaliates them so that they go up he side shoots them and he trains them to go out this way that way he gets the fruit dropping naturally from the bottom and he gets a really good crop. But in answer to your question, that's normal. But what I'm saying is I would take the end tomato off and thin that out so that it will produce a bigger and it will keep going that way. Mind you, the cherry and small tomatoes, they're, you, you eat them so quickly that they just go. But I mean, with a question, I really like that question about how do your tomatoes produce and why are they growing so that's great and I bet you it's the fact that they're sharing their root space with other tomatoes because they're community growers they tomatoes like their crowdsourcing they're crowdsourcing their their um, pollen they're they're looking for extra energy and they also like the fact that each other can shade the root a little bit although they just like to be in that they're sunbathers and that's why the indeterminants, you want to spread them and open their branches is because they're sunbathing. So that's how you take it from there. It's <laughs> a great way to explain it. So. Another thing too, I think about tomatoes, if the flowers are developing now, like we still have uh, all of August, all of September. Pretty, pretty much. much. And you know, half of July. So we have two and a half months to go. So it might look, I know on my tomatoes, it looks like there's a lot of, you know, uh, flowers are developing and, and the fruit's developing outside. And uh, yeah, so I'm looking forward to it. I figure, oh yeah, they're going to develop. I think they're going to develop. I think they are. And uh, <laughs> especially, especially with the two full moons that are coming, both of them happen mid-month. Mm -hmm. So what you're going to see is that we're getting a better day length, if you will. And I hope like heck that our night times are clear for the, the moon. It's getting harder and harder to find because they're trying to eliminate the hormone out of it. So there is a new thing on the market and it's called Blossom Set. It, it is the same thing as the tomato set. And you can usually find it. I found it at Garden Retreat and I found it at Plantation. Anyway, that, that look for both of those and you probably will need to use it maybe once or twice more and then they will start to set up. That's why I do this, because for the longest time, I couldn't find any blossom set or tomato set. So I, I'm the bee. I'm helping them to set. And sometimes it also is how much exposure they're getting to insects and, and good flying critters coming around. It's really important that the small, the small flying wasps 
they are really valuable to this crop production because if they're up too high, the little bugs don't go high. But the, the other thing is, is to plant a couple of planters up there in the high ground with some good flower production because that'll draw some of the smaller ones, especially this little guy, this dianthus, this small pink, it's part of the carnation family. And these, the yellow flowers, this is biddens. They attract them like crazy. Some afternoons I'll go by and mine is just full of bugs so I won't deadhead that day because I want them to stay and do their job. We, we were talking deadheading and I was looking at them and going, well, I want to bring this basket forward because it's a great opportunity to pull some of the dead flowers off. But you know what? Don't throw these away. Sometimes they've matured enough that they're making seed. And this one has. And that one's pretty easy to start from seed? Oh yeah, they're really easy to start okay. from seed. So, but they also make seed quite easily <laughs> once they have pollinated. So it is something that you want to look for too. No. Joan. Yes, ma'am. What was it you dug out of your shed this morning? Well, so we were talking yesterday a little bit about just kind of protect, like, yes. how do we protect our gardens in the summertime against this heat? And I said, hey, Kath, what about the gardener? And so, uh, of course, we all have our water bottles, you know, and we know about hydration. And, but I also keep a, a bin like this, and I usually keep it in my shed, but the shed's been getting pretty warm lately. And so, um, but no, this doesn't belong in there. <laughs> but things that I keep in this little bin, um, and I keep it out on my patio, you know, and guests use it when people come over and they've forgotten bug spray. So I have a couple of different kinds of bug spray in here. And I was just pointing out this one here is a botanicals. Um, you know, if someone's might be more sensitive. Um, and I have, of course, uh, some uh, sunscreen so I keep sunscreen and if this stuff doesn't work I have after bite just we in case after bite this week. <laughs> we need after bite this week that's right um, I'm surprised it's in here because my daughter was covered in mosquito bites the other oh. day so she must have left that in there um, and as well, I keep some of this. So this is the total sunblock oh. with the zinc in it. And um, it's really helpful if you start getting red on your nose. Um, I have, this is awesome stuff. <laughs> I'm, I am not paid, to, uh, this is not a paid promotion by any of these, but this, uh, so after sun, oh my goodness. Sometimes after I'm done gardening and I have my shower and I'm sitting outside, this is just... Is that the aloe stuff? It's the aloe and mm -hmm. it smells like, I don't know, I feel like I'm a tropical vacation. Okay, yeah, that's so that's a, good a one. gel. Um, and then this, my daughter, she went crazy the other day. She, she was using it the whole day. So this is a um, mineral water. I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but it's a bit of a luxury, but hey, you know what, when you're in the garden and you've been hot and everything and sweaty, this is a, like a vaporizing mist and it just, it just cools you off and, yeah. and, um, and also gives you a little extra moisture, which I think in, in Calgary in particular, we, we really need that. So, so that's it. And, uh, and my last thing also too for protection is, is sunglasses. So I'm not wearing them today, but um, that's because we have a tent now. We have a tent, but I see a lot of people are wearing sunglasses, and that's that's a They're great, really important, really super important really to protect important. our eyes when we're out in the garden too. So, uh, but anyway, so that's it. That's, so that's what, what I and you I, have in your shed. That's what or I have in, in my in shed and my little bucket or whatever. I keep it on the patio sometimes. So yeah, it comes in handy, I'm, and I'm not always running that's in and out of the house. That's very organized. But the other thing that we were talking about, Joan, was harvesting, and what are we harvesting right now? Or what are we preparing to harvest? Yes. And <laughs> <laughs> so in my garden, I've already been using my basil. So my herbs um, are, for me, I don't have a vegetable garden, as you know. Like, But I do grow, like you, a container of indeterminate small you know tomatoes. Containers down that side. <laughs> I know. It's changed since the last time. Oh, okay. I will come back. Yes. Um, <laughs> 
do still have my tomatoes there, which are not quite ready yet. And uh, but I'm harvesting. I've had a number of. Uh, uh, the caprese salad. We love caprese salad. So fresh basil is just right there and my chives are, I've already cut them down and to regrow them I've made chive butter. So that's what I've been harvesting is mainly herbs. Have you harvested the flowers off your chives? Not this year. I, I'm going to probably wait but I've heard that you can make an awesome chive uh, vinegar. Oh, that's that amazing. Yeah. The, I was visiting the Blue Flame Kitchen last week and they had made chive gravy. Gravy. <laughs> That'd be good too. Vinegar. But I kind of, I couldn't believe it because I, about three years ago, I gave them for their garden three chive plants. There are now 22 chive plants there. I said, we need to have a plant share here because some of this has either got to move to the trees or we're going to, but they made some chive vinegar and it turns a lovely pink tone, really tasty. It was really good. And that brings me to in the same family, how many of you are growing garlic? So what we have is it's time to start harvesting your garlic scapes. These are flowers that are going to produce the flower. And once they hit this stage and they're turning like this, some varietals go double turns, some do a single turn. My variety is music, it's a single turn. And it produces this flower. Well, at this time of year, it's time to, once they've curled, because you see, I took this one off and it isn't curled enough. I thought it was, but it was because it was resting on a leaf and it done, had done that. Well, I was wrong. But I got these two, and I'm still going to eat it. But the thing about it is that once they start to do this browning, it's really time to take them off. And once they start to curl like this, but if they haven't curled enough, they, they'll ripen and what they are doing is now they'll put all of their energy into going down and they'll start to feed the roots and the more that once you take off the scapes you're probably got about five maybe six weeks of the leaves starting to die back and once the leaves have gone brown it's time to take out your garlic but what I really like about garlic scapes it's Caesar salad time man <laughs> so it's time to start looking at that and I mean you get a bit of a whiff of garlic and because I brought them here in a plastic bag I nearly died I opened it in the car <laughs> brought a tear to my eye so it's time to start looking at things like that and harvesting and and I'm already have eaten five packages of radishes at least and right now with the moon being full when the moon starts to wane next week, plant another generation of radishes. They are really tasty this year. They were really, really good. And I'm, I'm getting to the stage with my lettuce where it's getting a little tougher. Plus it doesn't help that I own a dog who thinks she's a lettuce fanatic. So she eats lettuce. So in some of the vacancies in my garden with things that didn't germinate, I'm seeding in my lettuces. And it's also time for a second seeding of peas and beans if they got up tall enough and are growing. So it's time to keep adding some seedings because the peas in particular will continue to produce into, oh, I don't know, late September. Last year I was pulling peas still the first week in October. And the beans actually produced for me right in till the end of August. So I was quite excited about that. Now, Kath, are you uh, also harvesting things like Swiss chard? Like yes. And coming in? Yeah. Whatever? I'm doing Swiss chard. I do a bit of spinach still. I've been harvesting that. I'm starting to, my neighbors are getting a little wondering about me because <laughs> they get little baggies full of lettuces and spinach. And <laughs> the other day I was trying to give away radishes. So I just started leaving them on doorsteps. And then I was getting texts and phone calls. Did you leave these for us? <laughs> yes, I did. Just eat them. And I can hardly wait for the squash season to begin. I will be really, really annoyed <laughs> if I get too many. But my mom, my mom used to leave zucchinis on people's windshields. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> 
it was, and then she'd get a little note back on her windshield. Do not leave me any more zucchini. There's too many in the freezer. What we, what we look at is what can we continue to produce? What should we be looking at? And Joan conjured up my least favorite pest in the world yesterday. The little white moth that gets in your cabbages. Because I was bragging that my broccoli was producing really great flowers. And I said, well, you know, I fight with it and I fight with it. But as Joan and I were talking, we started talking about plant protection. Now, this is a, a product called, not insulate, insulate's heavier. This is Plant Guard. And Plant Guard is a really fine um, fabric. And it produces, or it allows the plant to be protected from the bugs laying their eggs. And you have to make sure you weight it. And then what I like to do is I use bamboo sticks and hold it up in a couple of places. Hence the reason I have the holes. So what I do is where I have holes. I'm such a cheapskate. I really, really do look at things that I've got in my, in my garden and in available, but I love this foam tie. So I will support it that way. And where that hole is, I cheat because I really don't want to throw it away yet. No. So I just do this and tie it. And then that's one of the places that I will use as an anchor spot. But I like to use this on my kale, kale, cabbages, and my broccoli. And this is the time of year when you want to get it on because pretty soon the little moths will be going by and they will look and go, oh, wow. And they will start to lay their eggs in our cabbages and our broccoli and will get really annoyed. And so I will put this on, and I'll probably do it in the next week or so, even though I planted a trap crop. I've planted dill all the way around my vegetable garden. And the dill has what they call an umble or flat-shaped flower. And the moths come and they go, oh, this smells good. I'm going to put my babies here. Thank you. Do that. So <laughs> I use that, and in my flower garden, the yarrow, with the flatter flowers, it really likes them, so it will go for those. And when it pollinates that, you don't get holes eaten in some of your really pretty flower pots because then the moth hasn't laid its eggs there. So you're looking at a coexistence with flowers and vegetables and with your ornamentals to get things going on. And I pointed out the dianthus and this is probably Wee Willy or one of those ones, one of the shorter ones. And I like to put these all through my garden because first and foremost, they do attract the pollinators. But the other thing they attract and get eggs laid in them are those um, little tiny blankety blank um, beetles that get into your um, potatoes, etc. And it works like a darn. And then I just go along and deadhead the babies. <laughs> but it stops all those holes appearing in your peonies or in your, and it works like a darn. So deadheading is important and composting them is really good because the heat from the compost kills off the eggs. So that's what you're looking to do. So do try to do, you know, a fairly strong planting of things that have various shapes of leaves, like the Bidens, the Biddens, the more I use it, the more I'm attracted to the fact that it has a fern-shaped leaf, which is a really good hiding and shade spot for the small uh, flies and pollinators, the mason bees, and it attracts them and they'll spend the heat of the day and then they'll come out and do some work late in the day. And yeah, you're sitting there going, oh, that's a mosquito or that's this and it's going to bug me. Well, they're not going to bite you. They're not interested in you. They're looking for their next food crop. They're looking for the nectar and they live off of that nectar. And they're just trying to go through their next part of their pollination life. We started out with a very, very wet and cool, cool part of the year. And some of our early flowers didn't last long, didn't produce 
I, myself, my daffodils went crazy this year. They're, they were everywhere. But then we got the wet and we got the cooler again and we lost color. But the peonies are producing more because the tu rhizomes, tubers, tubers are getting way more moisture and they're putting way more energy up into the flower bud. And the rain also increased the flower buds on them. So that's why you're seeing this. But just don't forget to compost this fall and get your soil a little richer and feed it up a bit. I did have an, on one of my, a couple of my peonies out front, uh, just some random stalks that stems oh. that just shot right up above their, oh. their other stalks and produced a beautiful, like that was the keener stalk. That was the one that really wanted to show off. And uh, so, yeah, yeah. Some of them like to be movie stars. They, they yeah, really do. Of the garden. Yeah, yeah, they true. Well, they're one of the divas. They're I like divas. my roses this past week. Mm -hmm. We've had all that moisture and now we've got sun. My Morden blush is just a big bouquet. Yeah. I could hire it out as a wedding photo <laughs> or something. <laughs> but it's a good year for roses. It's a beauty year for roses because yeah. they like our moisture. And that is an important factor with it. I mean, and if you've been watching the flowering shrubs that are in right in season right now, the mock oranges this year, have you seen them? Oh, you should smell them. We have one over, there is one over in the public garden over there on the corner. It is fabulous. It's flowering like a, and it's got the wonderful old fashioned orange scent to it. It's so lovely. And, and I mean, the nine barks are Nine barks are incredible with their burgundy leaves and their pinkish white umbels of flowers. So there's all sorts of things because we had the rain and now we're having a bit of heat. We're doing so much better, I think. This is also what did I call it yesterday? The steak season. Oh, I don't mean I don't mean eating steak every day. But it is that too. It, oh, it is steak. <laughs> On the barbecue. It's barbecue season, but, but. bamboo canes. And I will tell you that there is a shortage because they're not able to harvest them. But fabulous for going around and tying things up. This is the time when you should be spending some time out there and with your... Some of your color coordinated. Green yeah, string. Yeah, I have green <laughs> string. I, I was saying, though, the thing that irritates me about these garden green string is you lose the end and you end up with that. Drives me crazy. So, and then I have to spend half an hour in the garage trying to put it back in its packaging because if I don't, I end up with critters. But I found the end just by throwing it in the ground. Maybe I'll do that again. <laughs> but the thing is, they load it so that it does pull out of the middle, but then you pull the whole package out. But go around and tie things up and give them some air. The big thing we need to know now is to keep the plants aired, like get some good air circulation going around them, pick them up so that there's not so much going on on the ground. And you will find that for starters, you will have a much stronger plant by tying it up and staking. And you don't necessarily have to use bamboo. I cut up pieces of my dogwood when I'm pruning it and I'll tie it up with the straight branches out of the dogwood. I will go around and start gathering branching just because the only thing is that I've care I've hauled around branches that I've used in Christmas arrangements and I stick them in the ground the things grow oh, yeah. I've staked up a plant and I've got a dogwood growing and I now have a piece of curly willow growing in the backyard and I'm going <laughs> so you know, it's all in how we practice our gardening. That's right. Now you were, we were also talking last night about yes. the um, deadheading petunias because I noticed my petunias with this heat this last couple of days, Yes. boy, they have really taken off. And, uh, but there is a specific way. And I was saying to Kath last night when we were talking about this, that um, I remember hearing this uh, from you years ago. So show. Show us. Oh, the, the student? Oh, oh come on. <laughs> no, oh. come on. This so, is one of those chores you do without your pruners. These are, this is okay. fingernail, use. fingernail use. So do it before you have your manicure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no manicures in the summertime with no, gardening hands. No. So instead, a lot, of, a lot of times what I did was just, uh, here's an example of just pulling 
the bloom off. It's dried up and it's and it's uh, it's dead. Except the problem with that is that and correct me if I if I miss anything here, but um, what is left is still going to try to produce seed. So what you need to do is go right in and you pinch off that whole stem, that piece. So this was like this. And instead of just removing this, you're you're pinching right back down to the main stem. Or yeah, yes. the main stem. Yeah. And so you end up with this and that stops that seed production so that your blooms can continue to produce for the Should summer. Produce. Yeah. Well, geraniums are really important to me in the deadheading school. And I chose this container because we have a geranium that the head has gone. Yeah, there it is. And I prune and it takes the whole head out. You use that. Now, the thing about this particular head is that it's giving, it's going to die. And yes, there's still some viable blooms on it, but you want to prune it out because the seeds are up in here. You don't want to sit, this is a fiddly job when you sit and you fiddle them out. The only time you do that is if you're going to have your geranium showing at Chelsea at the flower show. That's the only time you do it. But I mean, really, nine times out of 10, a geranium will just pull out without the pruners. But I like to use a good sharp needle nose pair of pruners just so I can get the show and tell going on. And it, it's just a question of cleaning them out because geraniums will grow naturally quite shrubby. And if you cut straight across and use bigger pruners, you crush the growth. So pruning them and getting into the flower buds. To me, it's really important that we keep our flowers flowering. And the more we pick them, the more we're going to grow them. And don't be afraid to go into your perennial garden and deadhead it. Because a perennial lives up to its name. Yes, its initial flowering season may be the first month of July or the first two weeks of July. But if you go in and prune it off so that you've hit the new secondary growth, and it true will have, I'm going to get a finger puff but that's a leaf. <laughs> Or a, but you will find that the flower head will stick up above and if you just prune down to the main stem, there's new flower heads producing. You can do that with Helianthemum, Rebecca, your, even your purple cone flower will produce secondary blooms if you keep working at taking the stems out. I have another secondary set of pruners because sometimes I'm in there and I hit woody growth. So I'm always these are the two. And I honestly believe that the manufacturers of pants lately have seen me garden because now they're putting side pockets on our pants. <laughs> and I go, oh, what a good idea. So I didn't wear a pair today or I would have done my, you know, two gun whatever. This is called an anvil pruner with a parrot beak. But it's because this side isn't the cutting side right here. This is the sharp side. And the other thing that I carry in my tools, I quite often will get halfway through the garden and I have a sharpening stone. So what I will do is I will take and I will, and you just have to do it in one direction. It's like when they teach you at the place where you get your manicure. I haven't been there for a long time. Just go one direction and just take it. And I've had this sharpening stone, I think it's 15 years now, and I just sharpen my, my pruners. And these fancy little guys, you do both sides, because both sides are cutters. So you do both sides. And I keep um, rubbing alcohol. You know how we had to buy all that, those little, yeah. <laughs> you know, the little square envelopes? I discovered they have a great use in the garden because you can take them and open them up and you just clean all the junk off. So it stops the diseases from spreading and it's a lot easier on us to do it that way than to do whatever. But I find some of this stuff I often used to say to, some, to my husband, I've got all these really useful tools. 
I use soup spoons instead of trowels sometimes. And that's because I'm planting little bedding plants and I go along and I'm trying to be in a hurry. So it, it's all in what you're comfortable with. Okay, the, the trick with using a newer freezer is, yes, they freeze things, but it also has a big sign on it, frost free. So remember when we were kids and we used to defrost the fridge and all that frost would drip off? Well, the frost free is robbing them of moisture. And, and so what you want to do is, if you're going to put them in the freezer and freeze them, you have to put them in a plastic container that's airtight so that they will maintain moisture. And whatever you're stratifying them into, what you need is moist medium to put them in, like sand, sharp horticultural sand. And, and what you're going to do is just a very fine amount in with the seed and spread them out so that they're moist and they're spread. Put them in a plastic container to save them from the frost-free fridge because what's happening is the seeds are drying out. And that you give it, I believe you stratify for five weeks, six weeks, somewhere in there. Yeah, and then you want to get them out and you want to surface sow them onto soil. No, if you're going to winter sow, you have to hit the full moon in November this year is November 8th. You want to get them in around there because what we're going to start to see is heavy, heavy frost. So you want to get them in then and do put a bit of sand and that'll stratify them and keep them going. But mark them. Don't just put them in and forget about them because sometimes delphiniums will react biannually, which will mean that they will grow f greens and they won't grow flowers. So you got to mark them so that the following year you know where they are. Yeah, they produce only on their first year is their leaves. The second year is their flowers. Um, I don't know if recently you've been to Waterton after the big fire. Well, they had naturalized lupins all through the hillsides. And it's taken them, is it four years since the big fire? four or five it's finally they're starting to get them regularly but for a while there there were no flowers coming because it didn't get a first year growth so it's every second year so you've got to stay on top of how they're producing and don't plant little clumps of them plant them in a flock put them in yeah and that's what you want them to do but you have to pay attention to the one that flowered that year and make sure you gather seed or make sure that it spreads. They'll naturalize back to their normal, to their regular color. So you'll have to keep seeding in between the yes, that's what second year. Yeah. yeah, so that'll be how you do it. Keeping aphids away from lupins. Oh boy. <laughs> well, that's a trick and a half. I mean, we used, to, we used to get them in at the garden center and they already had aphids. So the biggest, the biggest adventure was trying not to kill the flowers and make sure the aphids didn't go out front with them. The best thing that I have found with preventing aphids within a naturalized bed is I will use uh, the umble flower trick again. I will put yarrow in with them so that that stops them. If you notice quite often, wildflowers like lupin, etc., will choose companions that have a flat flower and they will be with that. The other thing that does work like crazy for them is planting in snapdragons. And that they're a good trap plant for the... I also have a pair of garden gloves that I hunt for every year and they have a suede surface on the inner palm. And by... I will go out in the early spring when they, and put both on and I go around and do aphid patrol mm -hmm. and that works. I like it better than the toothbrush method because I'm not fiddly enough with that. So what do you do? I'm just rubbing them like this. I'm literally squishing. just squishing and pulling them off and it usually, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily use soapy water but I use my spray bottle to spray away the bodies because I don't want anyone to know I'm a murderer. <laughs> Mass murderer. <laughs> Mass murderer. <laughs> it's because a petunia has a very, very tight root ball, and as they mature, the root gets tighter and tighter. The fact that the ants are going in and tunneling through them and putting in anthills is causing them to just, the roots, once the roots are gone, they're not going to survive. Yeah, but you use, see these black pots here? Those are my ant hotels, but I have too many in the garage, so I planted, we planted them here. 
But what I do is I fill them up with, with soil and I take them and I do, I fill them with soil and then I put them right over top in the middle of the anthill. And then the ants climb up in through the holes on the side. And when you look for these pots, you look for the ones with the holes and at the bottom. The ants think that you've put in a high rise and they populated it. it usually takes three to four weeks and then do not dump them somewhere in the garden. You take the pot and the soil on black bin day. You wait till it's the day they're going to pick up the bin. Don't leave it sitting with the black bin for days. Go put it in the black bin and send it to the dump. Throw away the pot too. Unfortunately, if you dump the, this and save the pot, it's not going to work. So it'll probably take you two, two or three goes with the hotel and maybe do a perimeter of high rises and that'll you know, you can do it that way, but stagger them so that you're getting them a little bit aware. The other, the other trick, and I'm going to get a poo-poo about this one again, um, frosted flakes or fruit loops. And you get a blender. I have a dedicated garden. You take your blender and you go in and you turn them into a fine powder. Straight up sugar doesn't work. This doesn't work. And please, whatever you do, do not use that recipe online about borax and sugar. Anyway, take the Fruit Loops or the Frosted Flakes and you whiz them around in the blender and turn them into a really fine powder. And then just like you would put ant dust on the hill, you put it all through the bed. What they do is they consume it and the worker ants take it back to the queen and to the ants in the worker part of the lower colony. And they gorge on it because it's so sweet and it has a bit of corn in it and it causes their stomachs to explode. So they leave. Sadistic, aren't I? <laughs> that is, that's um, really and truly, it's anemia. Yeah, it's a chlorosis. Could be the fact that the compost is taking away the nitrogen and robbing, so you may need to pull away some of your compost. And the best thing you can do is get an iron product. And there's an iron product that contains sulfur or it won't take, it won't take up the, it'll won't affect your chlorosis. It's the straight nitrogen of the grass clippings that is making the plant develop the anemia. So you need to not only do a little bit of addition of fertilizers, you also need to add some good soil mix. You, you should really invest in say a manure in the fall Cow manure, steer manure is really good because cows have three stomachs. See, fertilizer comes with three numbers, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, and potassium. So when you're using just grass clippings, all you're getting is the straight green nitrogen. If you read the label on the ant be gone and any of the ant killers, it says it contains borax. But look carefully because on it, it says borax 0.00005. It's a very, very small amount, minuscule in fact, and borax is straight up borax. It's 100% borax. Borax is a soil sterilant. So it, I mean, if you want to sterilize your alley, <laughs> but I wouldn't do that personally because I feel all soil is valuable. So using straight up borax is too hard on your, on your ground. So that's why you wouldn't do it. And if you mix the sugar the way that they tell you to do that, you're just wasting sugar. They want an added flavor with that flavor of sugar. That's why these sugary cereals, they have a little bit of corn in there. They have a food source. They think they're getting a really valuable root. They're, they think they're getting my radishes, frankly. So by doing that, you're getting a more value to what they're eating and what they're chewing on. And those, I've tried the Fruit Loops. And yes. yeah, and they uh, will eat that up really quickly. Yes. So yeah, it's, uh, and, and they will move on. You're right. Yeah, I mean, they eventually they diminish and they move on. Yeah. About a cup on an anthill, that's right. Yeah. And I don't buy a huge box. I just buy the smaller box because that'll last me all season. And then if I need an emergency application in the spring, I've still got some. No. And that's what I also have in my uh, tool bucket. Oh, yes. I have a jar, like an old jam jar. Yes. And it's already, you know, ground up and everything. And I wrote on there, ant killer. 
<laughs> but anyway. Well, I keep, I crush eggshells. And I crush them really, really fine. Because, you know, you go to the store and you buy diatomaceous earth, which is essentially shells and, and et cetera. And I crush my eggshells all winter so that I have several jars. And I throw it in my hosta patch for the slugs. And it works like a darn. I put little trails all through the garden. The only problem is that you have to fence off your hosta garden when you own a dog because she thinks I put the eggshells in for her. So I put them in wherever I'm seeing slug damage. I put them in, for instance, the other part of the caterpillar seasons are coming and we're not just going to have cabbage whites. We get that little, I can see it, potato bug. You'll get them and the caterpillars go down into the soil. So I'll put them around my potatoes just to keep them going. Gradually, the eggshells start to just break right down and become part of the calcium layer in your soil. And I mean, yes, we have very, very hard water and we can have some serious calcium levels in our water, but it works really, really well. And I haven't touched wood, haven't had any problems with buildup of it. So I, and I do, I'm a, I'm a mad cultivator first thing in the spring. I go out with my hoe and loosen everything and talk to every critter I find and, you know, discuss their cohabiting in my garden because that's an important part of it. Now, one thing that I have noticed uh, yes. in conversations and workshops and things is nobody's talking about red lily beetles. Has anybody been seeing red lily beetles? Because I have had zero this year for the first time. And, and you know what? That doesn't even affect them because there's the first hatching and the actual red beetle. And she comes along and finds your foliage and then she's eating and laying eggs where the leaves join the stem. And underneath, underneath there, they're tricky devils. And then the babies hatch and they just keep going and they'll work up. And as, my, as Sarah Williams used to say, then you have to deal with the excrement to get to the babies because they put a protective layer of their poop on themselves so that you won't go in and squish them. That's when you bring the gloves up. Yeah, that's when, that's when gloves, these yeah. get these gloves going. However, I have not heard of them this year either. I've seen very, very few in any of the chats that I belong to. I have seen very few commenting that they're around. Perhaps... Dr. Fry from Olds College is having a great deal better success with his wasps than we know because it's a little tiny, tiny wasp. It's one of the reasons I fight the urge to swat or kill anything till I've identified what I'm seeing and they are very important to the system. So they're very valuable on that level. So do pay attention to those little flying guys. And I keep, I have a bug hotel so that the little wasps will overwinter. And I have blades of grass and I have open sticks and it's terrible. I go to, I go to buy these and I check to see if they're hollow because I might put some of those in my bug hotel. But my other, my other favorite thing is, my kids used to just about want to divorce me because I'd say, could you just go up to the front and get straws for me? And they would come back with two or three. I use straws all the time because I aerate. If I'm having a lot of water logging like we did, I'll stick them all through the pots. And I don't, I'm known for the fact that I kind of hoard this kind of stuff. So every once in a while I say in a loud voice, I really have to get stuff out of my, out of my basement or garage. And my friend Glenn, who gardens with me, It'd help if she got rid of the 1,200 straws. Oh, no. <laughs> you better keep them, though. Yeah, well, you do. Yeah, right. You do. <laughs> but, uh, well, I use them, and I cut them up like this, and I put them in my bug hotel. I have pieces of old stump that have cracks and things, and the bugs overwinter in there, and I'll let them, mostly because I'm not going to ask them in the fall when they're nesting, are you friend or foe? I, I just want to make sure that the population continues. Even, even the ones that are kind of bad for things, they do really good things in our garden. So that's why I fight with things like that. So you use the straws just like a splint yep. uh, on your, and your Gerber on which, oh, on your flowers that got flattened in the wind. 
That's a good one. Yeah. That's a really good tip. Now I got to save more straws. <laughs> the bigger ones. The, the bigger ones. Oh. Oh. Well, you know, you go to the florist and you buy Gerber daisies and they've got those big straws up those. And my friend, her husband brings them home to her all the time. So I'm standing at her kitchen counter doing. <laughs> so I think, but that's an excellent tip. See, that's why we come for an afternoon in the garden. Is to, so you plant your garlic spaced out and you put plants in between it because you, after all we are going to pull it, right? Yeah. Earlier than the carrots. So. Yeah. yeah for that oh. Tip, tips. Yep. Ooh, did you get that one, Deb? <laughs> <laughs> Write that one down, somebody. <laughs> but I like that idea because this year I'm trying celery for the first time and I had no room except in between the garlic. So I've been nursemaiding my celery but it's now up like this and leafy so I was having a conversation I used to live in England and I was having a conversation with one of the fellows I knew from the allotments and he says well now you need to protect them so that the stems will grow up straight and you'll get celery not just foliage so I kind of hunted around and so I've come up with the leader milk cartons and I've got them planted with the celery and they're up this high now and I'm getting stems instead of just leaves. Wow. So I'm quite excited. Probably, and I planted those in among my garlic because I'm hoping. Yeah, and that'll probably protect against some bugs too, right? Well, I, mean, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Anyway, he says, and he says, okay, now make sure you know they don't really flower. So you don't really need to worry about that part of it. You just need the wind circulation once the leaves get up in the above the milk carton. So I thought, well, good plan. Yeah. So I think that there's always a garden tip to be had. And I think that with a certain gathering of minds, we can put together quite a garden. Have you lifted out the pot to see what the water situation is building up in the pot? The only thing that might be happening is there's a buildup of water in the foam chips. So they're not evaporating the, the water fast enough. and Ferns are water cleaners. They will develop and take salts and extra calcium, etc., out of their soil and clean up the, the air around themselves. So it could be developing the brown spots because for starters, the reservoir might be too deep that with your foam chips. And the landscape fabric, is it the fuzzy landscape fabric or is it just the cheap stuff? Okay, well then it's draining well enough. But usually what happens with ferns is, and it's something I say to people all the time, do not water the top of a fern. You always cut it up like a pie and water various corners of the pie. So that could be it, but it sounds to me like it A, needs some fertilizer, and B, it needs to be, it needs to be strawed. You need to go in and stick some straws and make sure. And one of the things that I do, there's uses for bamboo skewer, you know. Anyway, I take these and I plunge them into the soil at various pots. And if the stick comes away clean, the plant is dry. If you put it in and it comes away wet, then it's too wet. And, and the thing is that a fern from its top growth to about an inch from the top should always dry out quite a bit. So you need to aerate it a bit, even if you just use a bamboo skewer. Okay. All right. Well, I think we're out of time. Thank you all for coming.